Welcome to Think Like an Improviser. I'm Jeremy Richards. In this podcast, we explore how the skills and insights of improvisation can elevate your creativity, confidence, success, and well-being. My guest for this episode is Joe Guppy. Joe is one of my comedy writing idols. As I mentioned in this interview, Joe and his wife Nancy were both big inspirations for me as a part of the sketch comedy show Almost Live. And in recent years, I've been fortunate to perform with Joe at Unexpected Productions. As a writer and performer, Joe Guppy has used improvisation in the creation of award-winning sketch comedy, popular songs, and a best-selling memoir. As a writing and creativity coach, he teaches his clients how improv principles and techniques can help them do their best work. Joe, thank you for joining us. Sure, happy to do it. Joe, you say that some of your earliest experiences in improv helped you recover after a stay in a mental ward. And yeah. that's also a central narrative in your book, which I've been reading <laughs> mm -hmm. and is really gripping. Can we start mm -hmm. there? What were you going through at the time? Well, it's multifactorial. I uh, was having a lot of difficulties in his early 20s. You know, I, I had a breakup with a girlfriend and then I was sort of kicked off into outer space with a drug that I took. It was actually a malaria drug. And, and now I'm aware of this is fairly, a fairly common, relatively common thing that this type of drug has this psychotic effect on people. And, but I had no idea. I know there's no, no warning about that to me when the doctor gave me the medication. So I, I already felt real stressed out and kind of, uh, kind of crazy just around uh, this breakup. But this put me into kind of a more delusional, hallucinatory world where some real deep fears uh, came up. So I, I actually believed when I was first in the mental hospital, I, I actually believed that I had died and, and gone to hell and that my psychiatrist was Satan. So it was pretty extreme psychosis there at the very beginning of the adventure. We know that you've come full circle, so to speak now, and becoming a mental health professional yourself or mental wellness as, as you might say for a period of time, right? Yeah. That was why I, when I wrote the book, I was a practicing psychotherapist. And one of the cool things about it is at the end of the book, I interview some of my, my colleagues. I actually interview this, this psychiatric nurse that I tracked down that was extremely helpful to me back in 79. And I interviewed her in the mid two thousands for the book. So that was a really meaningful experience. And there was also a Jesuit priest who was super helpful to me and I interviewed him as well. So it's my narrative. And then it's followed by these dialogues with other, with healthcare colleagues and, or mental healthcare colleagues and, and people that were helpful to me even back in the day then. But as you say, one of the most helpful things to me was coming out of that experience was I had taken improv classes before and I really liked them a lot, but I plugged back into the improv world and I didn't think about it at the time, but upon reflection, I realized, wow, that is exactly what I needed for my mental health at, at that point in time to enter into the kind of the offbeat world of, of the arts where in the straight world, as we called it back then, maybe I guess now that means something else today, but back then we called it straight society. I would be, you, you know, kind of it's the, the, the feeling was that people would be suspicious of my, my mental health history, but it, it just gave me street cred in the, in the art world. It's like, oh, you, you've been, you know, on the inside, you know, wow, hmm. cool. You know, street cred. And then it also gave me this outlet for my, my creative imagination, which tends toward paranoia if I'm in a mental illness place, but this gave me this positive joining with others in the, the crazy imaginative world of improv. Wow. So we see how they both fed each other, thinking about your, your mental states and what you went through to have that post-traumatic growth as they talk about now in the research. Yeah, right, right. In the other direction, then, how did improv help you stay focused or stay healthy? Well, you know, I remember very well uh, early improv classes where my world just sort of changed from, I say, two-dimensional to three-dimensional. I mean, it really felt that way, that my grasp on my body and space in relation to other people became somehow different through the looking glass 
I guess it's that heightened awareness that improv gives us where our senses are totally on alert because the listening is so, so important. And then when you're in relationship to an audience, you're always sort of tracking where you are on the stage in relation to your scene partners and that type of thing. And it just gave me a lot more confidence in regular cocktail party or something comes to my mind that I, I would just know where I was in space in relation to other people in a, in a way that I hadn't known before. I get this image of the superhero origin story where you have this power, but you don't know how to harness it, right? Yeah. Like Cyclops oh. from X-Men yeah, yeah. where he's just yeah. shooting lasers everywhere he looks and yeah. now finally he gets the right visor and the training and is able to channel it for good. And it wow. almost sounds like your mental forces were so overwhelming that you needed a vessel and some tools I, to. That's to fantastic. Them. Professor Richards, you have, that's, that is a really cool image. I love that. That's, that's really neat. I've, I've turned over these rocks so many times, particularly in writing the book. I'm getting deeper insights and deeper insights, but this idea of, of the, the I mean, I love the tremendous positivity of, the, of that, which you just suggested that my, my creative brain firing off in all sorts of directions, sort of without a proper vessel, it tends toward paranoia or depression or, you know, and sort of a lot of negative imagining fear, you know, anxiety. I mean, anxiety is just an imagined future that we're afraid of, right? But the idea that it is a superpower that improv helped to harness. And I would say that, you know, I've done a lot of other creative things as well, comedy writing, songwriting, and then of course, writing the memoir and, and all that. But all of those are like focusers for my superpower. That's, that's very good. And you ended up parlaying that into a great deal of success going even into television and Hollywood. What was yeah. your first foray into TV writing and performing? Well, that was with my very first foray was actually with KCTS nine and during Bumbershoot when my comedy group off the wall players was playing, was, was got, you know, playing Bumbershoot as we did for like four years in a row. And I'm not sure how the connection was made, but somehow this producer, Gary Gibson found out about me or something. And I just discovered that I could do this thing. I often played news characters or the newsman or whatever, the man on the street in stage show. But then I, I found I could just do this, this thing in front of the camera. And, and there's, there's some still photos of me working with, and you, I'm writing out notes. It's just something I, I came to do with almost live later for King TV, which is my more high profile local TV thing. But yeah, yeah it started with KCTS and just, it was sort of like, I guess it's another superpower or something just like, oh, I can just immediately translate this into a video thing and write a little script for myself and say it into the camera and it's working, you know, <laughs> it was so nice. great. Yeah. yeah. But of course it's also those producers uh, like, like this guy, Gary Gibson, who later came to work with my wife, Nancy on her, on creating her TV show. That's been now on the air for a dozen years or so, but, but I always think those pr pr producers, if you will, that, that find, discover talent. And there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and nurture it because I was very young, you know, I was like mid twenties and, and to get the kind of encouragement I got from, from KCTS early on, gave in, me confidence. And in reference to where you went from there, I have to share with you, as you know, from my the introduction to my book, I was living in a halfway house with mm. my dad. Mm -hmm. in my early teens and they had stolen cable there that the nun who runs the house somehow wired in wow. <laughs> and we had this tiny little television in a single room mm. that we were sharing and one of the highlights for me was getting comedy central at that mm. formative age mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and as you know some at some point comedy mm -hmm. central started to syndicate almost yeah. live <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And even being in Spokane at the time, we mm -hmm. didn't get almost live until it was syndicated. Mm -hmm. And it was a revelation for me. I had seen mm -hmm. other sketch comedy shows. I had seen Saturday Night Live and Kip mm -hmm. in the Hall and yeah, yeah. all sorts of things. But there was something about that that really yeah. inspired me. And it's, you know, that's mm -hmm. why it's amazing to, to come full circle and be yeah. able to work with you a little bit and learn from mm -hmm. you and meet Nancy as well. And just think like, oh, these are the folks yeah. that were giving me a lifeline, not just entertainment, but inspiration at such an important time in my life. 
Yeah, well, I, I love the way that there's so many stories like that where people see somebody and and it influences them. Like like a lot of us credit J.P. Patches for who's oh, yeah. a children children's television host who was on on the air here for I don't know 15, 20 years or something locally. And some people say the reason there's so many great cartoonists and and comedy and all that comes out of the Northwest is, is due to uh, J.P. Patches. And when I he was a guest on, on Almost Live and uh, you know, I got to meet him and, and his sidekick Gertrude and it was just, just such a cool experience. And then the other thing that comes to mind is Bob Nelson, you know, who was a, a stalwart on Almost Live for, for years and who oh, ended right. up, he ended up writing that screenplay for Nebraska for the Alexander Payne movie. Wow. And he was yeah. actually, you know, nominated for an Oscar. It's like, whoa, you know, just, and he's the most coolest, humble guy in the world. But he said that he was working at the Seattle Times and he saw Nancy and my work on Almost Live and, and that inspired him to say, you know, I'm going to send some writing samples in and the, the rest is, is history. So I, I just love how, you know, things are, are passed along like that. It's, it's so cool. You were coming to that show then originally as an improviser and then a writer. How much did improv play into the writer's room and to the development of the show? Yeah, you know, the way improv mainly showed up was when people would have a, an outline of a script and then the dialogue within a structure that had been written by the writer had to be fleshed out. And some of my favorite pieces with the John Keister, with the awesome Pat Cashman, are pieces where the dialogue was improvised between us during the shoot. You know, it's like <laughs> cameras are rolling and Let's do another take. And in all that time, we sounded really good, you know? <laughs> so so that, that's how that came out. We didn't really, when I was in Off the Wall Players, we created a lot of our sketches through improv. We would, we would rehearse and, and just, if you know, something looked like it was a sketch, we would rehearse it more until it became a good sketch. But with Almost Live, it mainly was the, the writers would write something and pitch it, like pitch, pitch the idea. So the ideas were not, themselves created through improv. Well, that gets to a point where you bring in as a writing teacher, great wisdom around structure, which right. improv yeah. sometimes struggles yeah. with, especially right. short form. We're not yeah. as used to plotting things out. Mm -hmm. Even with long form, we have some general ideas of what we want the arc to be. Yeah. But what do you see as most important especially for those who are coming at it with an improv energy and just used to creating in the moment, what do you feel is most important about teaching structure as a writer? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's recognizing the structure that's in an improv and, and then, and then seeing what's there because the, 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 some part of the structure is always there in any, in any improvisation. Just for example, there's a, it starts and we're, we're somewhere with some, some people and I call that the first balance. It goes by lots of different names. I kind of favor this, a five part abstract structure because it's so, it, it just handles any, any form. But I call it the first balance is when the audience, you look at it from the audience standpoint, we start out with these questions that we're not even aware of. You turn on the film or open up a novel or something. First thing you're asking yourself is who are these people? Who are these people? Where are they? What are they doing? It's really basic questions just to orient ourselves in that world of this narrative that we're participating in. And that comes prior to the story actually starting. Like there's a, a world that's created and then that's tilted as Keith Johnston would say, or the, the, the unbalance or the inciting incident where the story really starts with this world that we've, that we've established. And so if you realize that, and that's true of any, of any improv scene, no matter how wacky, because the audience is, that's what the audience is experiencing. We can say, oh yeah, I'm avant-garde. I don't go with those rules or anything, but the audience is <laughs> going to first ask themselves, who are these people? What's going on? And then they're going to look for when the story takes a little turn and the, and the narrative actually takes off. So those are the first two of my five structure points. And an improvised scene that is recorded in some way can be analyzed and then, and rewritten. And I think we all know that writing is rewriting. You've probably heard that one. And that's where the, where you just hone it more and, and structure it more. Uh, I feel to, like I went through that rebellious phase against structure and the risable forms of what you would normally see in my, maybe even to early twenties, trying to write mm -hmm. sketches and plays. Yeah. And things that would 
go against that. Robert McKee has some great insights mm. on that as well. Mm -hmm. That we do have to respect the audience enough to respect their intelligence that they can be challenged, that we yeah. can innovate, and yet there still has to be some semblance of yeah. the basics of storytelling. Or you know what you're, you know the rules that you're breaking. I mean, that's such a cliche. I, I have done on stage some of the most kind of unstructured narratives or lack thereof. That's kind of my, my lineage is, is the first improv teacher I had came out of the Bay Area and, and with a group called The Wing, which was there at the same time as the committee was, was doing, was creating Herald. There was this across town, I think in Oakland, there was this, this, uh, the Dell Close was, he was directing both of these groups. So my, my oh, wow. first, my first improv teacher came out of, you know, San Francisco area, Dell Close and all that. So my improv has always had kind of a surreal quality and it was a completely unstructured, just, just wackadoodle thing from one thing to another. But what we realize is there's a feel for it, that it does have a structure, but it has to be more like jazz, like freeform jazz. But you mm -hmm. know when something works and when it doesn't. And we just were able to, to do that. So there is some sense of structure, even in the most unstructured, seemingly unstructured thing, I think is what, what I'm getting at. Right. Well, you, you kind of earn the audience's attention and respect yeah. to the point where you could start to experiment. Did that change for you when you took even another step up into Hollywood, HBO? It was not necessarily the news, right, that you moved yeah. on to? Not necessarily the news. Joe Guppy. And whatever you do, always wear a, you know, a, a thingy. <laughs> because if you can't even talk about it, the next time you have, you know, you, well, you, you might, um, you know. <laughs> always wear a thingy. Yeah, why well, I, I was very fortunate to arrive in Los Angeles with a with Writers Guild job. I mean, no, which, uh, which immediately got me an agent. You know, all these things that, that people scramble for were just handed to me because of just the way it, it worked out that I was able to get my tapes through an almost live producer who had gone down with Ross Schaefer to do the, uh, the late show, I guess it was, that Joan Rivers had, had resigned and they needed a fill-in oh, host right. and uh, fill-in for her. And so Ross Schaefer, who was a former host of Almost Live, got that job. And then one of the producers down there found out about this, uh, not necessarily the news thing. And since I had done so many newsman type parody man on the street stuff, they, they bought it and bought, bought me and then. <laughs> We, my wife and I went down there as writing partners and, and it was just a tremendously cool experience to be in that intense crucible of writing because yeah. they would feed you three meals a day and uh, you'd work 16 hour days or whatever. Wow. And, uh, and it was, it was just oftentimes like, like super, super fun and super, super hard work. But I think in terms of like, like taking it up a notch, one of the first things that my agent ordered me to do was to take a story structure class and, uh, and that I, I didn't really know about story structure. I was practicing it and I was using those principles, but I didn't really understand it on this more abstract level until I took Robert McKee's class. And then another guy that I like a lot named John Truby, who's oh, got right. a, a really good book out on the structure. And I just kind of geeked out on that just right away. And so. We, we got on a really cool show that was called My Talk Show. It was executive produced by a former Saturday Night Live producer, and it was done for Ron Howard's Imagine Entertainment Company. Yeah. And, and it was a lot of fun, really cool, a lot of, a lot of kind of fun brush with greatness. And anyway, we ended up being kind of a associate producers or whatever. We were right directly underneath the executive producer. And, and that's where the story structure came in really handy because I work with other writers. We were helping to shape the structure of, of other writers' stories. And uh, that story structure thing really, really came in handy. Well, you mentioned, you said 16 hour days. Yeah, sometimes. Working closely as a married couple in a very intense competitive environment. Yeah. And I wonder to, to harken back to beginning of the conversation, did that start to take a toll on your relationship and mental health? To some degree it did, especially Nancy more than myself. And she got kind of burnt out on it. But what we realized was we could either be working together and see each other all the time, 
or not be working together and never see each other because of the, of the, the, the demand of the, of the hours that if, if we were working in separate writing jobs, or if one of us had one of these writing jobs, and the other one did, not the person who had the writing job would just be gone all the time. So we made it work, but eventually Nancy, she came back to Seattle to do almost live for that comedy central opportunity. And we ended up moving back to Seattle. And I became a therapist for a while. You became a therapist, by the by. Yeah. How yeah, did that yeah. come about? I mean, that's a kind of a, a left turn in your career. Well, you know, my career has had left turns, right turns, and spiral turns, and all kinds of stuff. Because the, one of the main reasons I got into therapy was because I was doing the the kind of work that I'm now doing with writing coaching and basically being a writing coach. And, and I realized that a lot of the work I was doing with people was pretty personal, you know, because people would, because that's the kind of guy I am. I'm just sort of open to that sort of thing. And, and so my, my clients would, would start journaling or writing real personal short stories and stuff like that. And sometimes I felt like, you know, this is kind of almost like therapy, but I don't, I don't have a license to, to practice therapy. And so I went out and got a that's license. That's what you call yourself therapy. a coach. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. If you don't know, and, and now I've, I've retired from therapy and I'm back calling myself a coach. <laughs> let, let At my... least you have that foundation in a real yeah. practice, but there is something to say about your foundation and credentials and understanding in that arena Yeah, where there is, is so much mixed up in our emotions, our biography, what mm -hmm. we're unpacking, yeah. we're trying to be creative and expressive right. that do you feel like you have a unique vantage point that way? Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, this is, this is leading me to, to think maybe I, I should lean into that a little bit more. I certainly noticed that I did a lot of group work when I was a therapist, really enjoyed that a lot. And I noticed that when I teach, you know, I'm coming up here in a few weeks, I'll be doing a improv class, like a basic improv class and a, a comedy writing class. But I did a, a in-person improv workshop for the first time at Tapper and Theater a few months ago. And uh, it was so cool to get back in the lives of people. People, person. But I do notice that because the, the feedback I get is like, wow, you're an intense listener. You know, that, that, that's what there was a, a guy from Taproot who, who sat in on the class because he was super interested in it. And so I, he was like, wow, you really attend to the students when they're, when they're making comments or talking. And I know that has to do a lot with my, my group's therapy training, you know, as, as a therapist, it's kind of a cool thing, you know, when you talk about the, the zone or whatever, it, it's not anything. And this is, I, I think this is true of my creative work as well. I, I'm not trying, you know, I don't, I don't try to do this stuff. It just kind of, fl it, it flows. Yeah. And I'm not self-conscious. I know that some of this is in your, in your book. I lose that self-consciousness and, and with, with teaching or coaching is very clear. I'm so focused on the other person that I'm not thinking like, am I sounding smart, you know, or gee, what am I going to say next? Because I'm deeply attending to the other person. And then the response that I come just flows out of whatever issue they raised or whatever question they, they have. Seems to be pretty organic. Is there a particular story you can recall about teaching, whether it's writing or improv and seeing that psychological freedom come out of the experience with one of your students? Hmm. Well, I'm thinking of one of my favorite clients who started wanting to write personal essays and over the course of time, she eventually got her piece published and then it was picked up by NPR's Hidden Brain. And it was really gratifying over time to watch her confidence grow because lack of self-confidence was kind of her, her main thing. She was not, you know, really educated in the, in the classical sense. And, and she also came from a, a background where her, her family moved around a lot. And the opening line of her, of her essay was, my father was a con man. But anyway, it was just really great to nurture her confidence along the way. She was often hung up by grammatical errors or maybe even spelling. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, we can, we can clean that up. That's no problem. But, you know, it's what you have to say and it's your unique experience and the, the really remarkable take you have and the perspective of kind of growing up in a home in which the gaslighting was kind of constantly going on because that was just the personality of her dad. 
And it also tied in because this was during the Trump administration. It really tied into the, my father was a con man. Well, the president's a con man, you know, so there were a lot of ways those connections could be made. And it was just a very satisfying to see the success that she had with that, with that piece and, and, and success she continues to have as a writer. That's amazing. And it's really resonant in seeing people who are dealing with imposter syndrome, which is mm -hmm. my specialty, yeah. as you know, they get yeah. caught up in what they think mm -hmm. is writer's block or a lack of ideas yeah. or yeah. technical issues with grammar and so forth. But it's really mm -hmm. more about the ego and about self-awareness mm -hmm. and about the deep dive that we all yeah. need to go into to find that authentic voice. Yeah, I was thinking about in preparation for this podcast about the uh, how improv informs my creative work, and and then I'd like, like to pass that same kind of thing on to my clients. And one of the fundamental things is called it's called timed writing for writers. It's kind of a odd name. It's very accurate timed writing because you set a timer for five minutes and then you write. And what keep your hand moving means. It means improvise. It means you, you have to just mm -hmm. take the next word that comes to your mind and, and write it down. And the instruction also says, if you can't think of anything to st say, you start writing down, I can't think of anything to say now. Right. And, and then you say the can on my ink, which it, which it is, this is the can on my desk. Yeah. And by the oh, time I get through perfect. saying, saying that the can on the desk is pink and then I, I've broken through that so-called writer's block and I'll be off to something else that that I want to say. That's a very pop writing technique called timed writing, but it really is an improv technique and, and, and it's very, very, very effective. Is there anything about your improv, especially when working with experienced improvisers where people say, wow, I never thought of it that way. I've never approached a specific element of improv in quite that aspect. Well, one of the things that I'm really interested in and kind of passionate about is the most popular cliche around improv is yes and. And, and yes and is, is good. That's a good thing because it says we affirm and, and then we add something else. The way that gets counterproductive is when it means that we, we have to agree on everything or, or, or in, engage in like happy talk. And, and that can be a great exercise, particularly for beginning improvisers. But I always thought, I think back to the original way I heard the yes and, and, the, and that was a, a don't, it said, don't deny. That was the rule that I heard back in the late seventies. And there's, and, and even though that's framed in a negative sense, it, it really says, don't deny Jeremy's reality. Whatever reality Jeremy has put forward, I don't deny it. You make your own reality. I don't have to say yes to everything you're doing but I don't deny it. Uh, right. And then, and then a more contemporary flip on that, which I got from Tandy Davis in a conversation. She had just come from a workshop in Chicago and I don't know what workshop it was. Otherwise I'd give, give credit there. But, but we had a discussion one time and, and she said that, that to acknowledge and respond and it was the, the version of yes. And I thought, yeah, I, I like that better. Acknowledge, acknowledge your reality and then respond to to that out of my reality. It takes away from that kind of yes and happy talk kind of thing that people sometimes mistake it for. It's reminiscent of Will Hines having that, this idea. I don't know if you're familiar with Will Hines. He's written yeah. a few books on improv mm -hmm. where he talks about let it play and let it land. Mm -hmm. So you're giving the offer and you don't just keep going. You kind of let it land on the other person and kind of let them react and, mm -hmm. and then let it. And then when you're receiving the offer, you kind of let it sink in. That way you're acknowledging from a more grounded place rather than just superficially yes ending. Yeah, we have to suspend our next brilliant idea. Uh, well, I once asked an actor, we, like I have two favorite actors for, for whatever reason, Denzel Washington and uh, Robert Downey Jr. And for me, they both have this similar quality that I can just kind of watch and do anything and it's transfixing. And I asked this actor, what to, why are they so good? And he said, it's that they're listening. What they're doing when they're, when it's not their line is what's the most important thing they're doing. It's like um, jazz, the notes that you don't play. Yeah, right. And the, or the notes that you let the other person play that, yeah. you, that you support. The, that idea of making the other 
person look good on stage, I think is that our, our job out there is to make the other person look good, which always takes me back to the film noir format that he has done a number of times. Did you ever, were you ever in the cast of the a film noir? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I did it maybe four or five years ago. And, and, a, and a couple of times I ended up as, as the detective. And uh, the detective is kind of the, the star of the show, but in another way, they're kind of the, uh, the, I want to, I was got to exaggerate and say they're the victim of the show because they're not, in, they're not in control. They just go, they're in every scene and they just go from scene to scene, kind of trying to figure out what's going on, like a detective and reacting. And, and, and reacting. And what our director, Randy Dixon said was, you know, take care of the detective. So when I was the detective, I was taking care of the detective, but. I remember a few times being the detective and being really well taken care of by the, by the rest of the cast as I wandered through the, the stuff that they created for me to, to, to explore. And bringing us back around to the community of support where you were taken care of, you know, in your journey from struggling to mm -hmm. being more in control to yeah. writing this book about yeah. how you made it through it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I can see it converging for you mm -hmm. for a lot yeah. of us. Yeah, a nice image that we're all we're all supporting each other, kind of in a web of improv. Yeah, and it also helps yeah. us get over that self consciousness of creativity. Yeah. yeah, where you are so concerned about what others think of you, mm -hmm. spotlights on you. What if you mess up? What if you're not perfect? Mm -hmm. What if you focus and sit on how do I make the other person look good? Right. Or if, even as a writer, how do I serve the audience? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In this moment. Yeah. I, I liked your, you were, as you again, you were quoting Randy actually in your book about creativity is a muscle, not a bank. Right. I, I think that's so true. And the other thing that came to mind while you're just now talking is I, I'm not nervous doing improv. I'll have some butterflies and some enthusiasm and energy and excitement, you know, before I, I go on, but. I was thinking about it. The reason that I'm not nervous is because there's no room in my brain for anxiety. In fact, I think Hook has, I think it says that somewhere in there about not having, not having room for fear or something like that. Is that, is that in your book? Am I? Yeah. The conversation with Rick Steadman, who was just on this podcast, I gets into that too, where when you're really in the moment and improvising and focusing on the other person, you don't have yeah. room for those self-sabotaging thoughts. Yeah. And when you really get into flow, as you referenced, that's when you feel more in service of the creativity and mm -hmm. something bigger than yourself. Yeah. And when your yourself feels like everything and that's what trips us up and, mm -hmm. and the ego really wants to have mm -hmm. it say, then right. that's the enemy of creativity, right? Yeah. I just had a kind of an image flow through my mind because one of the things that, that I like to say that I think is, a, I don't know if it's counter to improv theory or not, but people say your mind is sort of blank or empty, you know, like a, like a Zen emptiness. I find that's not really true for me. And part of right. it is what you alluded to about story structure. I'm tracking the story of the scene and, but I feels as if I've got all this, the, the brain is, is doing all these different things. Like there's, this is happening over here. This is happening here. This is happening there. And, and there's so much going on that I, uh, I can't be, there's no room for being anxious or self-conscious because there's all this stuff going on. But I just had the image it's be, of that. I'm kind of in the middle of all this brain activity that's happening around me. I'm kind of observing it. Totally Zen. So my primary mission probably is listening to the other person and being aware of what's happening in the moment of the scene. But I also, I track the structure. I, I think about what are, what's, what are the stakes in the scene right now? Where are we heading? It's usually a pretty primitive uh, because there's so much mm -hmm. going on in my mind, but it's a primitive tracking of the structure. Like I know there's kind of a yes, no point where this, the story is going, where the stakes in the story are, are directing. And sometimes I will say to myself, I'm going to try to win two more times. And if I don't win, I'll lose. <laughs> so, something like something like that and then i think there's also floating is like something i might say next there's th but it's like they're just going by on these different screens or something like that and i'm yeah does that, does that make sense because i remember I'm, i mean you yeah. you talked about one of my favorite games which is what are you doing and you talked about yeah. the way that you have this flow of to to play what are you doing successfully 
And I'm pretty good at what are you doing too, but I uh, analyzed what my brain is doing. It's different from what your brain was doing. And all that for somehow was a point related to, I think it was related to what I was just saying that this stuff is sort of floating by and work. Uh, I mean, do you, do you find that as there's stuff floating that you're sort of observing? I feel some people, according to the research, have different levels of visualization. It's not the necessarily the cliche breakdown of auditory kinesthetic and right. visual, but they, they might have preferential ways of, of processing thought. And so it doesn't surprise me that you and I have different operating systems in our, right, our brain. Right, I, right. I can relate to the visual structures, though, that mm -hmm. are a little bit vague. And I think, again, these creative outlets help us see that less as chaos and mm -hmm. more as mm -hmm. the, the raw material, the clay that we can shape into something mm -hmm. meaningful. Yeah, I'm extremely visual. And sometimes my wife gets really frustrated because I don't remember I, I don't remember who people are, but a lot of that is because if I can't see the picture in my mind of the person or, or a memory of, oh, remember when we were in such and such a place, if I can't get the picture filled in a specific memory, I can't operate out of it or something like that. So anytime I start talking about what's going on in my brain, it becomes visual really, really quickly. And that could be a superpower. Again, you just learn yeah. how to harness it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, Joe, thank you so much. We're going to jump into, if you're ready for it, our, oh. our, light, our lightning round. Yeah. Well, you and see how, how, how well I've done with your pop-up. <laughs> we will one. edit this to make it seem really fast. Turn around. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. And we're calling this the short form round, which is like a lightning round, but this is improv. So, you know, short form round. Yeah. And here's yeah. the twist. We're going to play this game like first letter, last letter. You're probably familiar with this. Uh, last I, letter, I first am. letter. Right. So a last letter, first letter for anyone not familiar means that the last letter of the sentence I say has to be the first letter of what Joe responds with. So if I said, what did you have for breakfast? Tea. Joe would say something. Toast. Oh, there we go. It could be that literal and straightforward. <laughs> so with last letter, first letter, Joe, what's one thing that people are generally surprised to find out about you? Unfortunately, I'm not a musician. And I, Stephen King once wrote that all writers would rather be musicians. And I think that's, that's true for me. You've written lyrics though, right? You've written songs. I've written songs and I've played the guitar and all that, but I'm not a true musician the way oh. true musicians are musicians. Although I had a guitar teacher who's a really good musician tell me you're a musician. So maybe I am a musician. <laughs> we all are at heart. Okay, tell me something you think is true that almost nobody agrees with you on. Nobody else doesn't like the music of Stevie Wonder. And you do not. I'm trying to parse that sentence. Yeah, it's, it, this is actually the basis of the little parlor game that I invented. And don't have a good name for it, but it's the, we call it the music game. And it goes like this. Who is an artist that is critically acclaimed, that everyone respects, everybody loves? You totally get it. You have no argument with how wonderful they are. You just do not like the sound of the music. And for me, it's Stevie Wonder. And when I say that, one guy said, I, I, I need to fight you. <laughs> and because people don't get the spirit of the game right away, which is, um, right. is that no, no, I, I, Stevie Wonder is awesome. I just don't particularly like the sound of his music. And when I said Stevie Wonder, I said, well, what's yours? And he said, Jimi Hendrix, Whoa. Who, is, who is one of my all-time top favorites. I had to fight yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. You got one, Jeremy? Yeah. Anybody? Oh, that, uh, right? that is universally acclaimed musician. Or group. But, or group that I just do not get. I know there are, and I, I used to work in, in music radio. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot that aren't universally acclaimed that I didn't get yeah. and would well, be fun a... of even as I played them. But that's an easy out. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you have exactly. to really risk something. By, yeah, by naming yeah. some artist Stravinsky. Is that too highbrow? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's excellent. That's the only time I've ever gotten a classical, a classical music composer as a response to this. And I, I like it a lot. That's great. Okay. Next question. What was the last thing you Googled? During the show, The Last of Us, that I've been watching, I Googled oh, yeah. that. I Googled that, uh, the fungus. The what is that fungus? Yeah. 
it's an actually beneficial supplement. It, as, it is as of now. <laughs> Cordyceps is a great health promoting fungus at the moment. It hasn't yet mutated into mm. human race destroyer. But really, yeah, I, it makes normal cordyceps think that she's cordyceps. It's why she's immune. I, I know it as this uh, the zombie fungus that takes over the brains of ants and stuff. But what is it used as a supplement for? I'd have to Google it as well mm -hmm. to remind myself. But there are a lot of amazing compounds in mushroom supplements, and I have taken cordyceps before. I think it's. I don't want to speak out of school. Let me let me Google it right now. So the truth about cordyceps: four sigmatic and cordyceps. Our cordyceps mushrooms, they've had to rebrand all this now that I'm looking it up because probably because of the show that some people. Yeah. Who's going to um, take it? I'm not taking it. Are you kidding me? I don't want to end up like what? those zombies. Yeah. And this is a supplement company. So they are leaning into it. They say, contrary to what you may have seen in the zombie shows, the mushroom is not dangerous. In fact, holds numerous benefits for humans. It's possible that this website was written by cordyceps. Though, but they say it's a good ally for pre workout endurance energy without wow. caffeine. So I don't, I have taken it and I have not yet turned into a zombie. Yeah. Then okay. You know last question, Joe. Yes. Last question. In your own words, what does the phrase think like an improviser mean to you? Until you invited me onto this podcast, I had not heard the phrase think like an improviser. But what comes to mind is what we were talking about earlier, which is to be in a sort of zen state, hovering amongst a lot of brain activity and choosing what one's next move is based on what the flow presents to you. All right. Thank you so much. Where can people find out about your writing, your classes, everything else you have going on? JoeGuppy.com is the place to go. Nice choice. Were you I mean, named after the website? <laughs> well, that's a good one. I saw I, I have Jeremy Richards dot com. Well, I so. saw that you I see we we must be early adapters or something because I think it must be it would be even more difficult to get Jeremy Richards dot com, which is a less I got it twenty three years ago, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, I don't I can't remember how when I got Joe dot com. There's this one guy in England who's like a rower. He's like a professional rower, Joe Guppy. He's my only competition on the world. <laughs> you need to just learn how to row and then just <laughs> drive him out of existence. And That's be right. the most I'm famous the, Joe Guppy rower as well. I'm the writing rowing Joe Guppy. <laughs> claim, <laughs> claim both both titles. All right, JoeGuppy.com. We'll link to that and to some of the other cool stuff that we talked about. Great. Today. Very fun. Thanks so Thank, much. You bet. Thank you very much. You can find more information about Joe Guppy at joeguppy.com. If you're listening to the audio version of this, you can get the full video with enhanced visuals and all that fun stuff at jeremyrichards.com. And for all of the show notes, transcript, previous episodes of the podcast, or to get in touch with me, all that also is at jeremyrichards.com. 